Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 13 to 30. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the, hor the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, and the entire musical ensemble, to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire, and who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind them and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? The answer to the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So they came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed. Their tunics were not harmed. Not even the smell of fire came from them. I went through a phase in college when I was developing my cooking skills of putting my own twist on every recipe and then renaming it. Like I coined a dish, the Italian job, and it was really just my version of a baked ziti. I also had for whom the casseroles, which was essentially a mushroom casserole. I was an English major, okay? Cut me some slack. I also made a broccoli dish, which I called Shadrach, Meshach, <laughs> Meshach and Abednego broccoli, which involved dipping the broccoli pieces in olive oil and then placing them face down in the pan until they turned golden brown. They're slightly singed, but not burned, I would explain to everyone as they ate my broccoli. And like their friend Daniel, I do think that these three men are heroes in this tale. This is our final Sunday in the retold sermon series. And as I was preparing to preach on Daniel in the lion's den, I realized that we often skip this part of the story, which is the precursor to Daniel's episode with the lions. Before all of that happens, there's this story of his three friends that are thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, all of them were Hebrew refugees in Babylon, and their names alone tell a really important part of this story, because in the previous chapter of Daniel, we learned that their real names, their Hebrew names pre-exile, are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In Hebrew, Hananiah means God is gracious. Mishael means who is like God, and Azariah means God keeps him. But the names they are given in Babylon reflect the oppression of King Nebuchadnezzar's empire and page, pay homage not to the God of Israel, but to the Babylonian gods. Shadrach means something like command of the moon god, 
Meshach means who is like Achu, and Abednego means servant of Nego, Nego being the god of wisdom, and King Nebuchadnezzar's favorite god, as it happens. Now, Daniel, the main character of this book, was also given a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, which means protect the king. In captivity, these people are stripped of their Hebrew names, which is an obvious example of the king's desire to strip away their religion, their heritage, and their identities. And we've seen this happen in history. Whenever people are taken into slavery, their names are stripped away and they're given new names as a way to claim them and oppress them. Previously, Daniel had helped these three friends obtain administrator positions in Babylon due to his correct interpretation of a king's dream. Everything seems to be going really well for them until the king decides to erect a 30-foot golden statue of himself and demand that everyone in Babylon fall down on the ground and worship it or face death by fiery furnace. The ego of this man is really something. And of course, word gets back to the king that three of his own administrators, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are refusing to worship the golden statue. And the text says the king go goes into this furious rage and demands to see them, and he gives them one more chance to bow down to the statue. But they politely refuse, and they give this powerful and beautiful speech saying, if our God is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, then let him deliver us. But if not, O king, let it be known to you, we still won't serve your gods, and we still won't worship your golden statue. The reason that these three men are celebrated as heroes of our faith is because of this speech. Whatever happens in the furnace is actually secondary to their speech because they're saying in no uncertain terms that whether or not God delivers them from the fiery furnace, they will under no circumstances, not even certain death, bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's false gods. And they certainly will not be bowing down to the ridiculous golden statue that he's made of himself. Now we're told that the king is so anger, angered by this that his face distorts. And he turns up the heat seven times hotter than it's supposed to be so that the guards who throw the men into the furnace actually die themselves. And we all know inside the furnace, the king sees not just the three refugees, but a fourth mysterious figure who looks like a god. Is it an angel? Is it God in human form who's come to walk alongside these refugees? Is it somehow Christ several hundred years before baby Jesus was born? We don't know. We could speculate all day. But the point is that these three refugees are not left alone in their hour of need. Whether or not they survive this fire, the king himself has testified that he saw them joined by a divine presence in the flames. In this story, the furnace is the place where your faith is tested in an ultimate sense. The place where you are asked to lay it all on the table and make a decision. Do you believe in God or not? And more specifically, do you believe that God will save us? Whether that looks like delivering us from certain death or simply delivering us into certain death that is imbued with meaning. In other words, the furnace is a place of crisis, a place of life or death, a place of choice, a place where we can no longer simply say, I don't know what I believe, I'm still figuring it out. In the furnace, we must make a decision and we must be able to articulate this complex and layered belief system that we are developing, which we call our faith. Some of us have walked through the furnace before and others have simply felt its heat from a distance or heard stories of other people's encounters with the furnace themselves. And even though the scripture passage makes a point to tell us that not one hair on these men's heads was singed, I stand by my broccoli dish and I say, you know what, it's okay if they came out of that furnace a little singed. They were in a furnace for crying out loud. I think we don't have to clean up the messy parts of our lives, 
We don't have to sanitize the hardships that we go through. And we can walk through a furnace, and if we survive and we make it out alive, it's okay to say, we got a little bit singed. As you know, I was not supposed to be here preaching today. Right now, I should be in a Bay Area fertility clinic coming out of anesthesia from my third IVF egg retrieval. But the medications didn't work this time for whatever reason, and our cycle was canceled, and we flew home last night disappointed and frustrated and wondering what we were going to do next. Infertility is a furnace. If you know, you know. And it's been my personal furnace for about a decade now, and it has made me question my faith multiple times, and I'm not afraid to admit that to you because I believe a pastor is nothing if not honest. And I know others have gone through other furnaces or are going through them right now. Separations, divorces, losses of loved ones, family feuds, chronic illnesses, chronic pain, childhood trauma, sexual assault, addictions, identity crises, midlife crises, depression, anxiety, body dysmorphia, PTSD. The list goes on and on, and I know we are going through these things. And an inevitable part of being thrown into these furnaces is a questioning of one's faith, a period of confronting your own beliefs, doubts, and questions about whether or not God is real and whether or not God is good and whether or not God cares about you. And I say it is okay to come out a little singed. I think that proves we are human and it proves we have lived some life. We are still standing. The flames did not consume us. And that is a victory. And I do find real comfort in this story in reading that God was present with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in those flames. I believe that God does stand with each of us inside of our furnaces as well. And as for their unwavering faith, well, I aspire to rise and match theirs. I aspire to strengthen my faith so that in the furnace I can have that sort of resolution. They refused to tie God's existence and worthiness to their own survival. They decide that death does not end God's capacity to create a future. And so they surrender their future to God, not to the earthly empire. If those three men had known in advance that they would be spared from death in the furnace, their words would have meant nothing. They would be following a mere formula. Their results would technically have been in their control if they knew the outcome. I think a lesson that all Christians have to learn at some point in our faith journey is that God is not a vending machine into which we insert our faithfulness and in turn receive the reward we are seeking. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abagnego trust God, but they don't presume to control God. And trusting God cannot be reduced to a formula for success or safety or prosperity. The good news of this story would remain true even if our three heroes, like so many persecuted people in the world, did not survive. Our faith tradition proclaims that the oppressor still does not have the last word, and God still creates a future beyond persecution and violence. So when you face the fiery furnaces of your own lives that will test your faith and ask you to take a stand for what you believe and who you worship, you will stand strong and know that you are not alone. God is with you always, even when you feel you are surrounded by the consuming flames, even when you cannot see a way out of your current reality. And since we're debunking some of these sanitized versions of our childhood Sunday school favorites, I want to point out that in this story, Daniel is in his 90s when, when he goes into the lion's den. This reminds me that God invites us into acts of faith throughout our whole lives. There's no retirement for faithful people. And age is not a barrier when it comes to participating in God's good news. I don't know if for some of our older folks that's like bad news. Like You just thought you could reach a certain age and you're done with these tests. You're done with the furnace. I think that's not true. Daniel entered that lion's den in his 90s and still came out stronger. When I texted a friend last night, 
while boarding our flight, and I told her I would be preaching tomorrow after all. She said, don't you maybe want to take the day off? But the thing is, I'm chasing hope right now, and I can't think of a more hopeful place to be than Claremont UCC, a community that is built on practicing compassion and kindness and support to one another. I believe that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego survived their encounter with the furnace, not only because of God's presence and grace, but also because their faith was strengthened by being together. We don't encounter the furnace alone, although it sometimes feels like we do. But I want us to remember that we have this gift in one another, this gift of community, and we're joined here together by this mysterious additional presence of God. So, let us give thanks that our God is with us always, even when we find ourselves in the furnace. We may come out a little singed by the flames, but by the grace of God, we will not be consumed by them. Can I get an amen? <laughs>